I thought I'd uh, talk with you today not so much about finance, but about deference and mystification. I myself am quite perplexed by why Main Street and all of us are so acquiescent in this political season, given the magnitude of what's happening in finance. So I'll briefly describe what I think is happening, proposals for reform, and then talk a little bit more about the obstacles to those reforms. And uh, I just had to put a little music in there because I was jealous of Jennifer John seeing those bongos and everything. I mean, when you talk about money, people don't come up and play bongos behind you. <laughs> <laughs> in an earlier time, William Jennings Bryan gave his speech about the cross of gold. And uh, the New York World had an editorial. This is an 1896 uh, cartoon. And the controversies were somewhat more tangible regarding finance at that time. In the present time, we have a fundamental issue, which I'll call financial services protectionism. We have a system where institutions are too large to fail, and fear of cascading bankruptcy between them forces our authorities and regulators to back them. The byproduct of that, whether it's through the discount window or Fed bailouts like Bear Stearns or guarantees like Freddie and Fannie that we just saw, is that it anesthetizes credit risk. People that live inside that loop lend money for people who are doing risky things at the wrong price. And without restrictions on the asset side of balance sheets, in other words, limits and controls, they will take excessive risk, and they will build things which we fondly refer to as bubbles. We do this out of some deference to, I, I don't think all forms of finance need to be referred to as the repackaging of property rights industry, but that's a pretty good approximation for what a lot of what's gone on recently. And there are all kinds of bald assertions which are never measured, never tested, about all of the benefits of finance. In an era when we see developing country money flowing into the largest and wealthiest country in the world into our risk-free government assets, I think we can question whether or not these uh, benefits can be proven. But we still have to provide this anesthetic because we are hostage to the bailouts. They are too big to fail and they can take us all down with them. And financiers price that into their decisions as well. <clears throat> How did we get here? We got here because we had an ideology of free markets where everything that was a regulation was viewed as a constraint. A constraint that, if it was removed, was supposedly going to make us all better off. We have very complex credit instruments, which I call the dry leaves, excessive leverage, and when the real estate bubble burst, it was the spark that set it all afire. The Congress and the regulators played a role facilitating this, and uh, campaign contributions certainly uh, played the role as well, which I'll go into. As you can see, finance has done very well. 43% of all corporate profits, when corporate profits as a percentage of GDP, are at an all-time high. Tom Johagen, who's a very colorful lawyer from Chicago, has an article this month in the American Prospect where he went to his law school reunion and he said, all of the children of all of his colleagues from law school who did well are working at hedge funds, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. How are profits made? Just quickly. Profits are equal to profit margin times volume. Volume in finance is leverage. And we create these complex products as financiers in order to give ourselves what you might call a, an entry barrier to intellectual property rights. The best way I can explain that, as I show you leverage, is the bebop musicians in the 1940s, after the discovery of the recording industry, were very, very angry because they were excellent musicians. But the white guys 
got all the recording contracts and made all the money. So the bebop musicians went up to Minton's Playhouse in Harlem, Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roach, and Bud Powell, and they made music too complex to be imitated. Well, that's what the financiers are doing too. When I talk about the leverage ratios, they're, they're, they're a product of this system, but they're absolutely off the map and our society's neck is in a noose as a result. Uh, as I said, the bebop music, the complexity creates the product, the profit margins, but complexity, and this is a quote from Emile Henry, who was an assistant secretary of the treasury in 2006, complexity is sometimes the enemy of stability. It breeds fear in a crisis. The side effect of that fear generating confusion is not priced by the private sector when left to its own devices. It is a myth that these people are marking to market and it's a myth that there are broad and deep markets. These are very concentrated institutions, what you'd call an oligopoly, and they mark to model, not to market. And they've all found that out very recently. Credit allocation is very dependent on trust. And when you don't know what's on your own balance sheet, you don't know what's on the next guy's balance sheet, and he asks you to loan to him, you're in the dark. And all these guys are flying in the dark in recent months. And they all admit it to themselves and off the record. Mortgages turned sour. Everybody got scared. Funding costs drove up. And when you got a lot of leverage and your funding costs go up, you got to start selling assets. One guy can sell assets and pull it all back together and raise capital. But the whole system can't do it at the same time. The, uh, I'll, I'll just move along. Uh, the major firms all have a lot of positions vis-a-vis -vis each other. They all stare at each other, and they're all trying to get out like an exit uh, in a crowded theater during a fire. The feedback to the real economy actually makes things worse. As they all try to sell things and delever, they weaken the economy, which causes the asset quality to deteriorate further, their capital to diminish, and the, and the spiral down continues. Was the Bear Stearns bailout, in my mind, wrong? It might have been done a little more artfully to hurt the stockholders and protect the taxpayers, but it was done in a, in a panic. And at some level, the big winners are all the other banks and counterparties who had reaffirmed the guarantees that everyone was too big to fail, including JP Morgan, who got paid guarantees of $29 billion for the takeover, and they had the largest derivative exposures in Wall Street, they might have gone down with Bear Stearns themselves. They should have been paying for that takeover rather than being paid to help. But uh, that's another for another day. Franny and Fetty's bailout is bothersome to me because instead of either just saying, okay, we have kind of a social goal here, and we're going to subsidize these guys, we'll nationalize them, recapitalize them, and the bank will own the upside as well as the downside. We're doing this middle ground stuff right now where the taxpayers get to keep the money. The, and I agree very much with what Tom said earlier. Is these are very important institutions. But the idea that you allow these equity holders to continue while giving more and more strict government guarantees seems to be letting the taxpayer uh, twist in the wind. And people who have argued that you should haircut these bonds, well, I don't know if I can agree with that because uh, all these foreign institutions that hold these things, if we were to default on that conjectural guarantee right now, the United States would have a very difficult time financing itself and the rest of the world would suffer as well. But that's not because the rules are good, that's because the rules are bad and we're in a bad situation trying to work ourselves out of it. There's a tremendous coalition of energy right now. I do a lot of work on the Hill, and I used to work with the Senate Banking Committee years ago, trying to avoid doing something. The cost of this is what will cost you $10 billion today will cost you 50 next year and 100 in two years. But Wall Street is very, very formidable with their campaign contributions. They do not want to have this fight before the election because cyclically that's when the voters' energy and recourse is the highest. If they can get past the election before they do a major restructuring bailout, then they won't worry as much about having the rules changed in their disfavor. 